Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Amy Smith. I'm the chair of the Department of Dermatology at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. We're so pleased to have you all join us uh, for the evening uh, tonight and the UNM School of Medicine community lecture. And we have such a fabulous turnout for the event and hopefully more people find us after they voted in the election. We sort of forgot that that was today. We're so grateful to Albuquerque Academy for continuing to host these lectures and partnering with the School of Medicine for the last four years to bring this type of education to the community. We also wanted to thank specifically Los Poblanos Inn and Cultural Center for the skincare products they provided and to Array Biopharma, who donated the None, No One Fights Alone bracelets. Uh, they are a, a, a pharmaceutical company uh, producing uh, treatments for advanced skin cancers. I also wanted to bring attention to upcoming dermatology-related community, community events, including skin cancer screenings that we've been sponsoring uh, by our department in conjunction with the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Shannon Shaw Memorial Fund, and the American Academy of Dermatology. The next one here in Albuquerque will be in the spring and May, and we really hope to continue to grow this program every year to bring awareness and support to this important effort. So tonight you'll be hearing from three of our fabulous faculty members, Drs. Nayara Barbosa, Mary Ann Berwick, and John Durkin, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for discussion, so please do write down any questions that you might have and pass them to the staff um, during or after the talk. But first, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a true friend to our department, Ellen King, who I hope will share with you a bit why this topic is so personally significant to her and why she's been so dedicated to helping us share information and promote awareness on this topic in New Mexico. Ellen? Thank you, Amy. Uh, the, the reason that I'm here tonight and was invited tonight is because quite literally, a few months shy of 20 years ago, my hairdresser literally saved my life. She was doing my hair one day and she noticed that a mole on the top of my head, a mole that I didn't even know I had, had grown, changed shape, and just basically looked ugly. She informed me of that, and she said, Ellen, you need to go see a doctor. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll go see a doctor. So I went to a do my regular doctor. He said, yeah, we'll, we'll watch that. And I went back the next month and had my hair cut again. And she said, no, Ellen, you need to have it seen by a dermatologist. The reason she was so concerned was when she got her cosmetology license. She had had an hour lecture by uh, someone, I don't know who, who was explaining all the various skin diseases and things that can happen to one's skin and how they should be aware so they could help the client. It turned out when I went to a dermatologist, he went and he looked at it and the first thing he said was, bad mole. And that's, that was his explanation. And as it turned out, they thought I possibly had a fourth stage melanoma. I was very fortunate in that it wasn't fourth stage. It was not as deep as they thought. And after the surgery, they watched me. I had tests and follow-ups. But it hadn't spread, and so I'm still um, I have had a couple of other cancers since partially because I've been aware to look what I need to look for. I've had other kinds of skin cancers, squamous and lots of base, those hardly. Uh, but the, the point of this is, I think of skin cancer lesions a little like little terrorists. You know, they're attacking your body and you don't even know they're around. So it's again that, that saying they have, if you see something, say something. So if, one of, if you see something on a spouse, a relative, somebody you care about that you think should be looked at, they may give you a hard time about it. But it's worth saying, please have it checked out. In my case, it, it did quite literally save my life. Thank you very much. John? Uh, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Nayara Barbosa. I'm a dermatologist here at the Department of Dermatology at UNM. My special interest is skin cancer and skin cancer treatment. Today, I'll be talking to you a little bit about the harmful effects of the sun as well as about skin cancers. The sun is a beautiful amenity that we have here in New Mexico. In all honesty, that's one of the major reasons I decided to move here. Just like everything else, though, if you get too much sun, so the sun in excess can have many harmful effects. Many people tend to believe that if they get tan and they have a little bit of color or they go to a tanning bed, they are naturally protected and they are not vulnerable to those effects of the sun. That is not completely true. If you are someone who gets tan, that means that you have some pigment cells that can protect you. So when you go outside, those cells start to produce pigment and that protects your skin and you get a little bit brown. But in the view of a dermatologist, or in my view, especially, a tanning is the same as a sunburn. They are both signs that you have already had too much sun. When you're tanning, your body's telling you, stop, I'm trying to protect you and I'm creating this pigment. And when you don't have that pigment to create, you just basically burn. But they're both sun damage. Now, sun damage can look like a lot of things, not just a sunburn. One of the first signs of sun damage may be freckles. Freckles can start very early in life. You can see a lot of little kids who have freckles, and they look like brown or tan spots. They will never go away once you have them. Sun-exposed areas are the most common places where you see these. In the winter, if you're not outside as much, they tend to fade. But then if you go outside and you're getting sun, they become more extroverted and they appear again. Another sign of age, age, aging and sun exposure, wrinkles. So as we get older, we'll all get wrinkles. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a way to prevent these. However, the sun can ac accelerate that process. And that happens because our skin has collagen. And collagen is our structure, our building blocks. As we're getting older and aging, we're losing that collagen. The sun accelerates that process. So if you're someone who spent a lot of time in the sun, you're using tanning beds, you're really getting older faster. You can see that some people, they may look much older than they are, especially if they work outside or they use a lot of tanning beds. And the third is bruising. So bruising, there are many reasons why you may bruise. And as we get older, again, our skin is getting more fragile, thinner, you're losing collagen, but the sun will accelerate that process. And I have a lot of young patients, maybe in their 50s or 60s, and they already have a lot of these bruises, especially on their arms. And that is a sign of too much sun as well. And I don't want to get too scientific here. However, I do think it's important to understand the basic structure of the skin. And this picture here to your right, that's what we see when we look under the microscope. The epidermis is the top layer of the skin. That's the surface. And the dermis is the middle portion of the skin where all those building blocks are. It's the bulk of your skin. You have your collagen, your hair follicles, sweat glands, oil glands. And the top layer of the skin, this epidermis, is where most of the processes that I'll be talking about, including the skin cancers, will be happening, or at least starting. Here you have all the cells that can cause damage. You have basal cells that can cause basal cell carcinoma. You have keratinocytes that can cause squamous cell carcinoma. And you have melanocytes, and they can cause melanoma. And here will be the collagen. So as we're getting older, this dermis is becoming more fragile and smaller. And the cancers, when they start here at the surface, eventually they will go down. When it's just at the surface, very easy to treat. We can even treat sometimes with a cream or lasers. But when they become deeper, you may need surgery or more aggressive treatment. Actinic keratosis are considered precancer lesions. If you're over age of 60 and has been outside, you probably will have those or have those. They look like dry skin almost sandpaper. You try to use lotion, Vaseline, coconut oil, whatever moisturizer cream you want to use, and that will not go away. Now, they're most commonly seen in sun-exposed areas, so the face, back of your hands, chest. If you're someone who worked outside and didn't wear a shirt, you may have it all over your trunk. And they're very easy to treat. The reason we want to treat these is, with time, they can become skin cancer. The chance is about 5 to 8% a year, but every year accumulate. So with time, if you have one of these and you're not treating them, 
they will become a skin cancer. The most common treatment is liquid nitrogen, and I call this the dermatologist's best friend. If you have been to the dermatologist's office, you probably have, you, you have been attacked by this little nitrogen gun. It's liquid, liquid nitrogen. And what that will do is we're burning the surface of the skin. So the precancer, the actinic keratosis, is happening right at the surface of the skin, so we can treat that very easily. We create a very superficial burn. The skin will peel off, new skin will come in, and it will be very healthy so all that precancer will be treated. Now, if you have many of those precancer lesions, it's hard to spray each one of them. So for those cases, we like to use either a cream, which is a chemotherapy cream, or we use a light treatment, and those will do the same thing as the liquid nitrogen. They will irritate the top layer of the skin, so that skin will peel off almost like a peel. New skin will come in, and the precancers are gone. So very simple. And just to remind you, if you have damaged skin, eventually that will become precancer, and eventually those will become skin cancer. And SCC stands for squamous cell carcinoma, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. When they first start, a lot of times they may be squamous cell in situ. And in situ means the surface of the skin is just on that epidermis. When they are not treated in a timely manner, they become more aggressive and they become invasive, meaning they're going deeper and now they are in the dermis. And we do not want to get to this point, so we want you to be very early. The skin feelings. There are three major types of skin cancers that we'll be discussing today. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And I will start with basal cell carcinoma. I should have put the new joker, but I'm outdated. So basal cell carcinoma, this is, I call it the best cancer to have if you had to choose a cancer. Not that anyone ever wants to have a cancer. They look like a pimp or a bug bite. They're a little bit shiny, and they will not go away on their own. They will keep growing. Now, I call them lazy cancers, and the reason is because they tend to cause trouble, but just locally. They're not cancers that will be traveling and going inside of your body, but if you leave them there with time, They'll continue to grow, they will be sore, tender, they can bleed. And if you do neglect them for many, many years, they can actually cause real damage. So you do not want to do that. It is estimated that about a million basal cell carcinomas are diagnosed in the United States every year. Extremely common. And unfortunately, the face, especially the nose, is the most common place to have them. If they're found early, we can treat them. The cure rate is 99%, so very good cure rate for a cancer. The second cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. And squamous cell carcinoma is just one step above basal cell carcinoma. And the reason is they can grow a little bit faster and they can misbehave. And these ones, if you do neglect them with time, they can grow and they can actually go into lymph nodes and have metastasis. They can look similar to the basal cell, like a wound that won't heal and they'll keep growing and they bleed. But they can also have this very hard crust, and sometimes you try to pick at it, and you pick multiple times, and they will just not go away and resolve on its own. These are some photos of some of my patients here, and they are pretty good-sized squamous cell carcinomas, and they grew very fast. Most of the time, it will be sun-exposed areas, just like basal cell cancer. And if you find them early, we do a minor procedure with surgery, and they are treated. If it, if you take a little while to have them treated, we may need to check your lymph nodes or even do radiation or more aggressive treatment. So you do not want to delay these. And finally, melanoma. Is that good, Alan? Okay, good. <laughs> so melanoma is the scariest and trickiest cancer. And the reason is it can look like anything, it can show up anywhere, and it can grow very fast. Traditionally, what you're looking for is a dark spot. And if you're someone who has a lot of dark spots, you may be asking yourself, how do I know which one I should be worried about? What you want to look for is pattern. You want to look for pattern, colors, and if something doesn't belong, we call it the ugly duck. That's the one you should be worried about. There's also a rule of the ABCDE of melanoma. A for asymmetry, B, irregular borders, C, color, if they have multiple colors similar to this lesion here, D, diameter, so the size of the lesion, and E, evolving, if they're changing over time. And that can be they're growing, they're bleeding, 
they're itching. And melanoma is tricky, as I told you, and they can look like anything. For example, right in here, this is a melanoma, and it's called a melanotic melanoma, meaning does not have pigment. And I just told you, it's usually a brown spot, but in these cases, they are pink, and they may look like a patch of eczema or a scratch. And these, unfortunately, they go misdiagnosed for many years until someone will do a biopsy, and they can be very dangerous. Melanomas under the nail and between the toes, they're not the most common, but they're also more dangerous because most people are not checking their toes that often, and they also go for many years before they're found. So when you're checking your skin, which I know all of you will go home and be checking, make sure that you're looking every part. Look between your fingers, toes, nails, groin area, because melanomas can show up anywhere. The highest risk factor for melanoma is accumulating sun exposure over time. But there's also genetic components. So if you know in your family has had melanoma, you are at increased risk. And if you have ever used standing bed, even once, you are at increased risk of melanoma. If they're found early, we can treat them very easily, just with a minor procedure. However, if they are already more aggressive and deeper, you may need more treatment because they can go to lymph nodes and they can metastasize. In those cases, you may need chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and you may need to see oncology. Do not worry, skin has heroes too. Here I am telling you about all the terrible stuff you could get on your skin and showing you these nasty photos of cancers, but there is hope, and there are a lot of people out there to help you. First line will be your doctors, your healthcare provider, your dermatologist. I know it's hard in New Mexico, there is a shortage of specialists, especially dermatologists. However, the, the primary cares, a lot of the primary cares feel very comfortable checking the skin or doing a biopsy and triaging if you have any concerns. Our department is also trying to increase our outreach and accommodate more patients, especially if you have a concern for skin cancers. And don't forget other people who are in contact with your skin, your massage therapist, your hairdresser, as Alan shared with us, they are looking at your skin, and if they tell you there's something looking funny, do not ignore. Especially if they're seeing you over time and they notice that that is, that is changing. And lastly, your family. I tend to tell my patients that they need to have each other's back, meaning if you have a partner, a significant other, someone you're close to and you trust, check each other's back. And if they see anything that it looks concerning, always better to be safe than sorry. So then go see a, a dermatologist or your primary care to have a biopsy. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about treatment. I told you that some of those cancers can be treated very easily with a minor procedure. And what does a minor procedure really mean? So these are outpatient procedures, meaning you come to the clinic, you are awake for your surgery. We usually use local anesthetic, which is a needle poke and it burns a little bit. You don't need to go to sleep or get general sedation. The procedure may take an hour, a couple hours, you get some stitches, you'll go home the same day, and overall do just well. And they tend to heal very well. The cure rate for most cancers, including the basal cell, squamous cell, is about 98% or higher. Melanoma changes a little bit depending on how deep that melanoma is. But there's absolutely no need to delay treatment because this is a very simple treatment to have done. And very few cancers can be treated. Skin cancers can be treated if you find them early. And most surgery, most surgery is my specialty and what I do most of the time, which is a specific type of surgery where we are cutting as little as possible of the skin, but we're checking the margins under the microscope. And we reserve that for cancers that are considered higher risk and they are in cosmetically sensitive areas. This is one of my first patients here in New Mexico. And as you can see, he has a pretty ugly, big squamous cell carcinoma in front of his ear. I wanted to show you this because this red line shows how big the cancer actually was. So as we're doing the most surgery, I kept seeing cancer and I had to cut this big to remove the cancer. So a lot of times what you see on your skin may not be the entire story. It may just be that tip of the iceberg. So if you see a lesion, even if it's small and you're like, you know what, it's small, I'm going to ignore, it may actually be spreading and be much bigger than what you think it is. And then I added this photo. This is the same patient three months after the surgery. As you can see, he looked really good. 
I have had many patients here in New Mexico who they delay their treatment or they do not want to be treated because they're worried about scar. And they are worried because it is in a sensitive area. Most of the time, those cancers will come in sun-exposed areas, but they tend to heal very well. So what I want you to remember, go home, check your skin, and do that maybe once a month or so. If you find anything you're concerned about, please have that checked. And if it is a skin cancer, have them treated as soon as possible. Thank you. So, good evening. Um, I'm Marianne Berwick, and I'm an epidemiologist. Uh, so we'll change from clinical to, uh, I do research, and I do research on melanoma. And I was brought to this uh, field because one of my best friend's daughters died of melanoma at about the age of 22. So what we have been saying is that if you do find a melanoma or if you find a funny looking spot, please go have it checked early. And if you think that somehow you have an incorrect diagnosis, you can go see another doctor, but it's really important. Um, as an epidemiologist, um, I work internationally with people in Australia where they have the highest rates of melanoma, as well as people in New Mexico where we have very high rates of melanoma as well. And what I want to show you is only two slides of statistics. Um, right here, what you see is the incidence and mortality rates for melanoma over a period of time from about 1975 to 2005, but the rates look very similar even today. So that you see the male incidence in the red line there is going up. It's gone up three times since 1975. And the female incidence has gone up, but not quite as rapidly. And there's some difference, some biological difference between males and females and how well they handle this cancer. But um, as you'll see down at the bottom, male mortality has gone up over time rather slightly, but significantly, whereas the female um, mortality has stayed somewhat the same, but it too has gone up. You can't really tell very well from this picture, but there's good news here. So today, our um, oncologists and scientists have found new treatments for melanoma. These curves here, the top curve in particular, um, shows you males over 50, the people who die most from melanoma, um, the rate was going way up, and then you see it going down precipitously. And you see the same thing with the other age groups. And this is due to the introduction of the new immunotherapies and targeted therapies. And they're using immunotherapy for many cancers, but melanoma is really the poster child, where we started discovering that um, you can treat the immune cells, not the cancer itself and make them react against the cancer that's going on. So um, we're very, very hopeful that this will continue. I'm sure it will. And um, that everybody will uh, have benefit from this. So I have a little quiz for you. And I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to point or ask you about each of these people here. And I want you to tell me if you think that person is at risk for developing melanoma. So number one, how many of you think this person is at risk for developing melanoma? Okay, what about number two? And then look at number three. And number four. So you're a very smart audience. <laughs> um, they're all at risk for developing melanoma. And what you see here is, oops, oh dear. How do we go back? <laughs> OK. There we go. OK. So what you see here is a gentleman with albinism. And so his melanocytes don't make very much um, melanin. So he doesn't have a lot of melanin to make melanoma, but sometimes he makes what Dr. Barbosa told you about, which is amelanotic melanoma. It's a pink lesion on the skin. And it's usually not discovered until very late. So it uh, can be quite lethal. Number two is this lovely young woman who has light hair, light eyes, skin that doesn't tan very well. She doesn't have many moles, but many people who get a lot of melan or get melanoma do have many moles. And she's our poster child for getting melanoma, especially if she's in the sun very much. Number three, some of you may recognize, is Bob Marley. He um, is from Jamaica, and he died from melanoma because he got 
um, the acromelanoma, again, that Dr. Barbosa showed you, it was under his toenail. And um, you can get it under your fingernails. You can get it on your feet. It's usually not done to, uh, due to sun exposure, but we don't know what it's due to. So it could be due to sun exposure. But in any case, anybody can get melanoma. And then this lovely Hispanic woman will also get, can get melanoma, is at risk for getting melanoma but much less risk than the uh, number two next to, um, next to her. Okay, so I talked to you a little bit about melanin, and you can see the first three um, young girls up here on the top left, those three girls are at high risk for developing melanoma. They have very light skin, they have light hair, and they undoubtedly don't tan very easily because they're kind of red-haired or blonde. Whereas the young women down on the bottom, they, will get, they can get melanoma, but it, uh, they'll get it at a much lower rate because they have more melanin, and melanin in the skin is, is somewhat protective. So if you look at these pictures here, you can see over on the left that this person with very light skin will stay out in the sun one-tenth as long as this person with darker skin before that person burns. So your burnability or your, um, your lack of melanin will determine how much time you can actually spend in the sun and um, safely. So this person over here will not spend very much time unless they're protected. And um, we will talk a little bit about protection in a bit. But um, this person here can stay out longer but also needs protection. So I also wanted to point out to you that melanoma occurs all over the body. And what you have here is a series of um, melanomas. These spots are all melanomas that were found by a study in Boston and New York. And over here on the left, you see men um, and their backs and women on their backs, uh, men in the front of their body and women on the front of their body. And um, since you're so smart, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what the difference might be, but what you see is that women have many more melanomas on their legs than men do, both on the front and on the back. Men have a bit more melanoma on the trunk than women, and women seem to have a bit more on the arms than men. So we don't know why that is. It used to be that people um, thought that women had more melanoma on their legs because they wore dresses. But uh, we don't all wear dresses anymore. And um, also, if you think of how the sun uh, comes down onto your body, you get very little sun on your legs. But furthermore, um, it's, we think pretty much it has to do with hormones and other biological factors that separate the risk between um, men and women. But again, Dr. Barbosa told you, you can get melanoma on any part of your body, even parts um, of the body that have never seen the sun. And again, we don't know exactly why. But as we've been saying, sun exposure is, is a really important risk factor for developing melanoma. And it's particularly the intermittent sun exposure, the kind of sun exposure you get on the weekend when you've been working inside all day, or as a child um, out on a holiday vacation. And in addition, children are, appear to be at higher risk when they have a lot of sun exposure early in life, and then later in life, they develop melanoma. Our data show that um, very strongly, and this is data from around the world. Um, blistering sunburns in, in children should be avoided at all costs because they might set the um, body up for developing melanoma later in life. And again, I want to emphasize that it's the light hair, light eyes, most important, skin that doesn't tan easily. If you don't tan easily, then you need much more um, protection. And then also many moles. And if you have moles that you um, are worried about, again, we said this, that you um, should go see somebody about them, especially if they're irregular and have an irregular border or many colors or just simply look funny to you. So in addition to um, physical characteristics, um, Inherited genetics makes a big difference into how at uh, risk you are for developing melanoma. And there are genes that we have found that run in families. And um, if you have a first degree family relative with melanoma, so a mother, a father, sister, brother, or even a child, 
or, and if you have more than one, then you really do need to see dermatologists often because you're at much higher risk for developing melanoma. Um, in addition to some of the major genes, there are some modest genes that people inherit, such as the red hair color gene. Um, and this woman is being very safe. She's staying under a tree in the shade. But um, you can have a red hair color gene and be dark haired like I used to be. <laughs> and, uh, um, and also tan easily like I do. But um, you can um, still be at higher risk for melanoma if you have this particular uh, variation in your red hair color gene. So this young girl is one of those people. She could be at high risk for developing melanoma, not only if she has a red hair color gene, but there are other genes that I won't bore you with, but that they are important among people with dark hair and dark eyes, and they can lead to melanoma. And we're finding out more and more about the genetics every day, and uh, it's pretty exciting because that's an area I work in. So not only do we worry about genetics and your phenotype, but it's happened, as you know, over time, that um, people are wearing fewer clothes now than they used to when they go to the beach. Um, if you see um, around the early 1900s, people used to go to the beach very well covered. They'd wear hats, they'd wear long stockings sometimes, but they'd wear a fair number of clothes. Whereas now, if you go to many beaches, not just um, the Riviera, uh, but um, many beaches, you'll find people wearing next to nothing. And in Europe, some places, um, not almost nothing. In any case, <laughs> in any case, um, this puts you at high risk for developing melanoma. And um, we have published papers on this, and uh, it, it uh, really makes a difference. But there's one group of people who is not at higher risk for developing melanoma, and that's outdoor workers. It doesn't mean they don't get melanoma, but they're not at higher risk, such as people who, don't tan, who uh, don't tan well. So it may be because they're wearing clothes out in the sun. It may be because they have adapted to the sun because they're working outside all the time. Or it may simply be that people who um, are at risk, who don't tan easily, stay away from these kind of jobs. So we don't know exactly what it is, but it's an interesting phenomenon and probably would shed some light on our understanding of who develops melanoma and why. Now, I also want to say that I love the sun. I moved to New Mexico from the East Coast because I wanted to be in the sun. And um, there are benefits from being in the sun. And the most well-known one is that sun uh, exposure in a limited way helps people with SAD, or seasonal affective disorder. And there are some others that the data are not very clear right now, but there are a lot of studies that show that having um, ultraviolet radiation might protect against colon cancer, against breast cancer, against prostate cancer, or be part of the solution, not the entire solution, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, MS, and hypertension and diabetes. I know when I feel kind of uh, worried or upset, I love to go s sit in the sun in the shade, the shady sun. Um, so uh, some people um, think that that's due to vitamin D that you get from the sun, and we don't know. Um, I keep looking at the literature, and there's some very new studies that have just come out going over, looking at hundreds of thousands of people, and they do not find that their vitamin D levels protect them from getting diseases. However, so it may just be that having a high vitamin D level is the result of your having good health. It may not be a cause for uh, good health. And this is controversial in the literature. However, the National Academy of Sciences has spent a fair amount of time looking at the issue. And they, we certainly do know that you need vitamin D for healthy bone and uh, muscles. So um, it's something that we need to think about more. So one interesting study that came out was looking at vitamin D levels in surfers. Now, one of the part of the uh, problem, the controversy with vitamin D, knowing what you should or shouldn't have, is that some people think you need fairly high levels, like 30 
uh, nanograms per milliliter. So when you go to the doctor, they'll say your vitamin D level is good. Or they'll say, no, it's too low. So it depends on who they're following, whether they're following um, the, um, the National Academy of Sciences or some other group. And in this particular um, graph that I'm showing, um, you can see that if you say you need 30 nanograms <coughs> per microliter of vitamin D to be healthy, um, there are very less than half of the surfers in this study were healthy. And that's kind of hard to believe. Here they are in Hawaii at the equator. They're outside in the sun quite a bit. And sometimes they're wearing wetsuits, but not always. So however, if you look at these two bars right here, this is 20 nanograms per milliliter. And if that's what the National Academy of Sciences recommends. So if you have 20 nanograms per milliliter, they say that's a healthy level as far as they can tell by the data. And if you look here, you'll see that almost all the surfers had at least 20 nanograms per milliliter. So as I said, this is controversial. And I just want to share with you that um, it's an important thing to be following and thinking about. So how do you get vitamin D from the sun? Do you just lie out and take it in as much as possible? Um, most experts say that if you get three times a week, if you get 15 minutes of sun exposure on your face, your arms, maybe your legs, that that's adequate, particularly in our environment here in New Mexico where we um, are at 34 degrees latitude and we're at high altitude. So we can probably even do with less sun exposure to increase our vitamin D levels. And basically, um, my message is that you should enjoy the sun at the same time as protecting yourself. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Berwick. My name is John Durkin. I'm a dermatologist at UNM. This next part, we're going to talk about how we can protect ourselves. I'm just going to start off with a short video from the American Academy of Dermatology. I use protection. I use protection. I always use protection. I'm using protection right now. Sun protection, of course. UV exposure is the most preventable risk factor for skin cancer. Use protection when you're outdoors by seeking shade, especially during peak sun hours, by wearing sun protective clothing, including a hat and sunglasses, and by wearing a broad spectrum water resistant sunscreen with at least a 30 SPF. All right, so let's talk about protection. So when we talk about protection, the first thing we need to talk about is sunscreen. It's probably one of the most important things to discuss when it comes to protecting yourself from the sun. Now, we're lucky nowadays that we have so many options to choose from when it comes to sunscreen. We have sprays and lotions and sticks and potions. Um, but to be honest, when you go to the store to pick out a sunscreen, it can be a little overwhelming and make you feel a little bit like this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what to look for in sunscreens and help you sort of understand what some of those things on the sunscreen bottle mean. But before we talk about sunscreen, we should discuss quickly about what we're actually trying to protect ourselves from. So the sun emits what's called ultraviolet uh, radiation. And ultraviolet radiation, what it does is it goes into our skin and into the cells in our skin, and it damages the DNA in those cells which can then lead to mutations, which down the road will cause those types of skin cancers that Dr. Barbosa was talking about earlier. And when we talk about UV or ultraviolet radiation from the sun, the two that we care about are this UVA and UVB. There is a UVC, but most of it's filtered out by the, uh, the atmosphere, and it, it's not a big deal when it comes to uh, what we're talking about today. So UVA penetrates deeper into the skin. It can go very deep into the skin. And this is what contributes to aging and wrinkles and can also contribute to the production of skin cancer. UVB, however, stays up a little bit higher in the skin. And this is mostly what leads to sunburn when you're out in the sun too long. But UVB can also cause skin cancer. So when we're looking for a sunscreen, we want a sunscreen that's going to protect us against UVA and UVB because both of these can cause skin cancer. And 
in order to figure out if your sunscreen has both of these, you want one that says broad spectrum. So if your sunscreen does not say broad spectrum, you're not getting full protection from the sun. So let's talk a little bit about the different ingredients or different components of sunscreen. When we talk about them, we like to divide them into two categories, physical sunscreens or mineral, and then chemical sunscreens. Your physical sunscreens sit on top of the skin, sort of like these umbrellas, and they act as a, a barrier from any ultraviolet radiation coming down from the sun. Because they sit on top of the skin, they work immediately, and they're great for people with more sensitive skin because it doesn't actually get absorbed into the skin, or people with allergies to sunscreen and things like that. Now, chemical sunscreens are like these sponges here, and they're located actually in the skin, or in the epidermis, the first layer of the skin. And because they have to be soaked into the skin, it really takes about 20 minutes or so after you apply them for them to fully work. And these act like sponges, so they're actually absorbing the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So how do you know if your sunscreen has a physical sunscreen or a mineral sunscreen, or if it's a chemical sunscreen? So our physical sunscreens contain either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Sometimes, too, on the bottle, you'll see it written as a mineral sunscreen. And again, these are good for people with more sensitive skin or with allergies to certain sunscreens. So here are some examples of some mineral sunscreens or physical sunscreens. So you can see zinc oxide is one of the ingredients. And here's another one where it says mineral on the front. So how about our chemical sunscreens? So our chemical sunscreens, as you would imagine, have lots of chemical-looking names to them. You don't have to memorize all these names. Just know if you look at the back and it doesn't have that zinc or titanium in it, it's probably a chemical sunscreen. And these don't tend to be on the front of the bottle. They tend to be in small print on the back of the bottle. Right there. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it. And you'll see a lot of sunscreens, in order to provide broad-spectrum coverage against UVA and UVB, they use different combinations of these chemicals in order to achieve that coverage. So what's the difference between physical and chemical sunscreens? I mean, it sounds like everyone should be using a physical sunscreen because it doesn't get absorbed in the skin and um, better for people with sensitive skin. But physical sunscreens tend to go on a little bit like a white, pasty material. It's hard to make a formulation that goes in nicely while your chemical sunscreens tend to get absorbed much more easily. So when it comes to wearing sunscreen, we really recommend that people make sunscreen part of their daily regimen. One way to do that is to put sunscreen or wear a daily moisturizer with sunscreen in it, at least SPF 30. A lot of people, too, who wear makeup ask if there's sunscreen in their makeup, if that's OK. But a lot of times, makeup doesn't provide full coverage, but can be a great addition in addition to any other sunscreen that you're applying. So what about the coral reef? I'm sure some people have been hearing stuff in the news about the coral reef and sunscreen, and I'm sure some of you have heard, too, Hawaii's banned certain types of chemical sunscreens. So there have been some studies more, more in the lab showing that certain ingredients in chemical sunscreens might be harmful to coral reefs. And the, it's still a controversy, and we're still you know, waiting to hear if, if this is actually the cause of some of the damage to the coral reefs. But if this is something that you're concerned about, or if you're going to Hawaii, you want to get one of those physical sunscreens with the zinc or titanium in them, because those have been shown to not be harmful to coral reefs. So what about sunscreen and hormones? I'm sure, too, there's been some controversy in the news that some people have been hearing or reading about lately. Uh, so there were some studies, mostly in the lab, in test tubes and in mice, showing that certain ingredients in chemical sunscreens may change certain hormone levels. So if you have kids, uh, and this is something that you're concerned, get, concerned about, again, just stick to those physical sunscreens, those with zinc and titanium. But it's still something that, you know, hasn't been proven yet. And right now, there's been no study to show that sunscreen is harmful, or the ingredients in sunscreen are harmful in humans. So bottom line, what's the best sunscreen to use? It's really the one that you're going to wear. So whether you prefer a chemical or a physical sunscreen or a stick or a spray or a cream or one in your moisturizer, it really doesn't matter. As long as it's a broad spectrum sunscreen, you're applying it every day, and it's waterproof if you're going to be out in the water on the beach. So what about natural sun protection? I have a lot of patients that come in and 
you know, ask me, is there something natural that I can do? And it turns out there's a couple things that have been shown to be helpful in protecting you against the sun. One is this fern, which grows in the southeastern United States. It's something called polypodium leucotomus. And it's actually formulated into a, a supplement. Um, this is one of the brands, but there's a bunch of companies making this, this supplement. And it offers about an SPF of five protection if you take it by mouth correctly. So it's not great to use on its own, but it's something that might be good in addition to using sunscreen and some of the other things we're talking about. There's also a vitamin called nicotinamide or niacinamide, which is a, a form of vitamin B3, not to be confused with niacin. Don't get niacin. This is different. And there's lots of studies showing if you take this vitamin, which is available without a prescription on Amazon or in the store, 500 milligrams twice a day, it might reduce your risk of skin cancer by up to 23%. So this is something we actually use in most of our practices in our patients that get a lot of skin cancers, and we have them start this vitamin. So another way to protect yourself is by seeking shade, which we don't have a lot of here in New Mexico, but um, installing some shade sails at home or at schools can be helpful as well, especially during the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when the sun's at its strongest. And then wearing sun protective clothing. I'm not saying you need to go out and look like this person. If you go online now, there's lots of companies making more stylish, more fashionable sun protective clothing. So if you're hiking, you know, a wide brim hat, a long sleeve shirt, and I like to do this a lot too because it minimizes the amount of sunscreen that you have to apply and then reapply. And then another way to protect yourself, like we've been talking about multiple times tonight, like Dr. Barbosa and Dr. Berwick mentioned, is it's a great idea to really keep track of your own skin, to be aware of your skin, to deliberately every month or so take a look at your skin and see, is there anything new? Is there anything changing? We know patients and people who are aware of their skin are at a lower risk of dying from melanoma. So it's really one of the ways that you can protect yourself the best. Let's talk for a second about what not to do. Indoor tanning. So we know now, very, it's very clear that indoor tanning is absolutely a cause of skin cancer. So much, in fact, that the FDA puts this in the same category as a carcinogen as smoking cigarettes. So much so that in Australia and the country of Brazil, they've entirely banned indoor tanning throughout the entire country. Unfortunately, here in New Mexico, it is still legal for minors under the age of 18 to do indoor tanning, and that's something that we're diligently working on changing. So don't do indoor tanning. So our takeaway points. Apply a broad-spectrum sunscreen. Seek shade during the day, especially between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Use sun protective clothing. Be aware of your skin and deliberately look at your skin every month or so. And if there is something that you see that's new or concerning, bring it to the attention of your provider or doctor. And then lastly, don't use tanning booths. So this is now the end of uh, the lecture part of our talk. In a couple of minutes, we'll be holding a panel and answering some of the questions uh, that you guys have written down. Thank you. All right, is this on? Can you hear me? Louder, okay, can you hear us in the back? I think they're gonna adjust the volume for us. Wonderful, okay. So we have lots of questions, so hopefully we'll have time to get through all of them. And um, but thank you so much for the engagement. Uh, so uh, I think we'll start with the topic of sunscreens. Um, so our first question is, when should you use SPF above 50? Because there are some that are 100 or more. Sure. So uh, really, as the SPF gets higher, you sort of get less and less benefit from the higher SPF. And really, in terms of protecting yourself from skin cancer, SPF 50 or above is okay. But there are a lot of studies showing if you want to protect yourself from aging and the effect from the sun from aging, using a higher SPF or SPF 100, it might have some benefit. But what is the best protection for one's lip? So using a chapstick, or there are certain sunscreens that are available for the lips or lip balms that have SPF in them. I apply sunscreen to my face every morning when I wash my face. Do I need to reapply it if I don't sweat? Really, the recommendation is to reapply sunscreen every couple of hours. 
Um, I mean, the more you're in the water or wiping your face or sweating, the more of that sunscreen is going to get washed away. But you probably should reapply every couple of hours. Should sunscreen be rubbed in or left on as a white film? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can rub it in as, as much as you can, although some formulations of sunscreen are harder to rub in than others, but it'll work just as effectively if you rub it in. Are you feeling on the spot? Should I switch topics? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're almost done with the sunscreen ones. Is PABA a chemical sunscreen, and how effective is it? Uh, so it, it is a chemical sunscreen, and it's effective in helping to provide that broad-spectrum coverage against the UVA and the UVB. So it is a common ingredient in the chemical sunscreen. Do you have any concerns about titanium dioxide and causing dementia? No. <laughs> is it true that sunscreen degrades and you should get fresh supplies frequently? Um, especially the chemical sunscreens, yes. Especially if you leave them out in, in high temperatures and the heat. Um, the zinc and titanium sunscreens don't tend to break down as much. And can you talk about the ingredient mexoral? <laughs> Is that the one in Europe? Yeah. yeah. I believe it's a, it's a sunscreen ingredient in, in Europe that's not FDA approved in the United States. Um, but it's a component in a lot of sunscreens internationally. Right, broad-spectrum chemical right. sunscreen, right. Is specialty clothing with SPF or UPF any better than regular clothing? So that's a great question. So it turns out uh, UPF or the you know, sun protective clothing isn't regulated like sunscreen through the FDA. So there's not a whole lot of oversight in, in, you know, somebody checking those numbers on SPF clothing. So I would sort of take things with a grain of salt when it comes to SPF clothing that it's just not as heavily regulated as our sunscreen. So let's switch to Dr. Berwick for a moment. <laughs> is there a concern that use of sunscreens are preventing people from getting adequate vitamin D? That's a good question, too. And there have been a number of studies that have shown that sunscreen does not prevent you from getting vitamin D. Um, I'm not sure if there are any negative studies, studies showing that it does prevent you, but um, I think that the totality of the evidence at this point is you can use sunscreen and you will get vitamin D at least the amount you need. Um, I'm sorting through. How good are imaging techniques at determining the depth of a skin cancer and could imaging allow a deeper first cut in Mohs surgery? This is, this is my area of interest. Yes, but, it is. Um, so there's many different kinds of, of imaging techniques out there. Uh, some that are be, being used in the clinic today, one called confocal microscopy, which is something that we do. Um, but that one's not great at estimating depth. But there is uh, a form of, of imaging, something called optical coherence tomography, or even some forms of ultrasound that can help uh, determine the depth of a skin cancer. But I don't know of anywhere that's really using this to help decide the, the first cut for Mohs surgery. But perhaps in the future. I don't know if Dr. Barbosa has any other comments about that. So when we're doing Mohs, we know that most cancer will be at least in the epidermis and dermis. So usually the first cut will have to go to the fat. And that is also the way when we're trying, after we remove the cancer and we're trying to repair the hole that we left, it needs to be down to the fat, otherwise that skin doesn't close nicely. So most of the time, you actually don't save much. You're just saying, you know what, I'm just going to scrape that surface because if I do that, I can put stitches, and then you're going to have a round circle that is superficial, and it will have to heal on its own, and it will be a circle scar. Now, Dr. Durkin and I actually have been using the confocal, which is the imaging, one of the images he's talking about for melanomas when we do moles. And the reason is sometimes melanoma can skip areas and be a bit more aggressive. 
And with that, usually what we're checking is the peripheral margin. And we're trying to gauge how far we need to go. But most is overall very simple procedure and fast. So if we have to do imaging for every cancer, it would really increase the cost and probably timing. So I, I think it, it's great for certain cancers, but probably not for every cancer. So to that effect, can you talk just a little bit more about Mohs, who it's specifically for? So you could justify doing Mohs for almost every cancer. Most of the time where you we want to do Mohs for is what I call the higher risk cancers. And higher risk cancers are usually the cancers that are on the head and neck area. And the reason is because there you don't have that much skin they tend to grow faster, they have had more sun damage in those areas. If you had a cancer on your back, we can easily put a good margin there and send it, you know, cut a send it to the lab, just do a regular excision. The cure rate for that is pretty high. On the face, it's harder to just go and put a centimeter margin or half an inch and cut something close to the eye. Um, and sometimes those cancers can be trickier. So with moles, even though I'm cheating the margin and cutting a smaller margin, because I am checking under the microscope, I know, well, I don't want to say 100%, but 98, 99% that the cancer is gone. So usually it will be for cancers, any cancers, neck up, also uh, hands and feet, because the skin there, there's not much laxity. So we want to cut as little as possible, sometimes genital area. If you have something on the trunk or arms and legs that is over two centimeters, they usually qualify for moles as well. We'll stay with the surgical theme for a moment. Um, if someone is having a skin cancer removed from their scalp, is there any reason to avoid dyeing the hair? Um, not necessarily, but probably if you had a biopsy done, you will have a wound there. Um, and if you try to dye your hair, probably it will be sore. After surgery, usually you want to wait a f usually a few weeks. So probably we should tell my patients to dye their hair before, just because for a while they won't be able to, because you want that skin to heal and it will be more sensitive. So if one has a small non-pigmented skin lesion, is it okay to have it frozen off without a biopsy? That depends. So if you're seeing a dermatologist or primary care physician who has an idea what that lesion could be, and let's say it's a skin tag and it's a very, you know, obvious skin tag, I'm okay freezing that. Or if it is a wis what I call wisdom spot, a seborrheic keratosis that comes with aging, those we usually can freeze without worrying about a biopsy. But I would not advise anyone making their own judgment and freezing away things or removing things on their own without knowing what it is. Um, can you talk a little bit about how fast squamous cell carcinoma can metastasize and how effective the scrape and burn procedure versus Mohs might be to treat squamous cell? So squamous cell, if it's a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, again, just that top layer of the skin, the epidermis, we can treat with electrodesiccation curettage, which is the scraping and burning. We can also use the 5-fluorouracil cream, which is the chemotherapy cream, and the cure rate with the scraping and burning may be about 95%, depending on where that cancer is located and how big it is. It is operator dependent because when we're scraping and burning, we're not sending a sample to the lab. Now, invasive squamous cell carcinoma, sometimes I do scraping and burning. For example, if you have a bunch of little ones on your legs and I don't think they are very high risk, I may actually do a scraping and burning procedure. Now, for... Um, Surgery, if it is a cancer that is deeper, you definitely want to have surgery. I don't know how fast they grow. It really depends. Some squamous cell may be very indolent, and they may take a while to grow. Some, I know patients tell me, and sometimes I don't believe them, but they tell me, oh, this showed up two weeks ago. And they can grow that fast. And it, it really depends on the subtype of the cancer. Can you uh, discuss 5-fluorouracil versus amiquimod, the topical managements we were discussing, when you might use one versus the other? So 5-fluorouracil, in my opinion, is the best cream to use because I think it is more aggressive. And to me, the more aggressive you are, the better. So 5-fluorouracil is used a lot for actinic keratosis. It is also FDA approved for squamous cell carcinoma in situ, which is that very early squamous cell carcinoma. Some people also use for superficial basal cell carcinoma, although the cure rate is not as good. 
In Mequamatis aldera, it can work for superficial basal cell carcinomas, and I believe it's FDA approved for that too, and for actinic keratosis. I just don't think it works as good. They have done studies that actually show for precancers, they work very similarly. I think for superficial skin cancers, 5-fluorouracil work, would work better. Switching to some medication questions, does niacinamide interact with any other medications and or is there any time it's contraindicated? No, nothing that comes to mind, but you know, before you started, if you are taking other medications, I just recommend that you talk to your, your doctor or pharmacist just to double check. And how effective are antioxidants? Are there any recommended antioxidants or recommended doses? So there, there hasn't been any conclusive studies showing, you know, topical vitamin C or topical antioxidants have actually prevented skin cancer in humans. A lot of the studies and things that have been done have been sort of in the lab and in test tubes. So the, uh, the niacinamide or nicotinamide is, is one of the things that's actually been shown in humans to help prevent. But I think, you know, more research just needs to be done on those antioxidants. Um, this is a scenario of someone who has a kidney transplant who knows they have to avoid the sun as much as possible because of the immunosuppressive medication that they take. Is there anything else that should be avoided like other medications or other risk factors? We actually have a clinic for transplant patients because they are a special population since they are at increased risk of getting skin cancers. So with the transplant, most of the time you're going to be on medications that naturally increase, unfortunately, your risk of getting a sunburn as well as your risk of getting skin cancer. And most people will be on prednisone for a while, then tacrolimus, sometimes the cell sept. Um, some studies have suggested that changing tacrolimus to serolimus, which is a cousin of the medication, may actually decrease the rate of skin cancer, but is not usual, it's not usually done unless you are someone who gets you know, 20, 30 cancers every year. Uh, but unfortunately with transplant, you need to be on certain medications for your transplant. Is the age of diagnosis of melanoma going down? i.e., is it being diagnosed in younger children uh, or teenagers? And the follow-up question is about ocular melanoma and if we're seeing that commonly as well. So the age of diagnosis is going up for melanoma. Um, about um, 25 years ago, the median age was 52. Now it's about 62. Um, and we are not seeing more in children than we had previously. But in terms of ocular melanoma, there's been a huge amount of attention paid to that. And it does seem as if it's going up. It's very hard to disentangle the effect of looking for something, the diagnosis, from an actual increase. But there are some excellent treatments, and um, so it's good to find it early. And what is known about the relative exposure risk from diffuse radiation, i.e. a hazy or a cloudy day, versus direct radiation, i.e. a clear sky day with the sun? Is there a ratio that we know of that risk? No, and in fact, on a hazy, cloudy day, you might get just as much UV radiation uh, coming to you on Earth as you would from a clear day. So under all circumstances, it would be a really good idea to wear your hat and clothes and um, take shade, uh, but they're, they're essentially the same. So our, our final question um, on the topic more of cosmetics and or um, aesthetic treatments that might be recommended, but can we, can we talk a little about retinoids, retin-A or retinol, um, how that might affect both wrinkles and sun you know, damage or skin cancer risk um, and or anything about injections? Sure, I'll answer that. All right, so uh, <clears throat> first off, retin-A is an old brand name for a uh, a prescription medication called tretinoin, which is actually a medicine that is approved for acne, but it does have some benefits in terms of anti-aging, um, at reducing some finer wrinkles and some sun damage that's been produced over time. There is an over-the-counter version 
of this called retinol, which is sort of a cousin of, of that tretinoin um, that does something similar. It just isn't absorbed as well. But there's definitely been a lot of studies that have shown some benefits in terms of anti-aging and anti-wrinkling for both tretinoin and uh, retinol. And what was the injection? Um, just if we had anything else to share or thoughts on injections, uh, especially perhaps to enhance wrinkle appearance. Yeah, so there's lots of cosmetic treatments and injections that are available. There's, um, you know, Botox and its cousins that are used to help with wrinkles, especially on the upper face. And then there's all sorts of, of injectable, uh, what are called fillers, which can help with restoring volume, especially in the lower part of the face. And do so. those dissolve? Do those dissolve? So Botox usually lasts about three to six months. And in terms of those injectable fillers, it really depends what kind you have. There are ones that are permanent that stick around for the rest of your life. And there's other ones that contain what's called hyaluronic acid, which usually lasts anywhere between 12 and 18 months. Thank you all for those really amazing questions. Um, thank you and for your attendance.